So to start off, uh, the five college consortium is made up of Amherst, Hampshire, Mount Holyoke, and Smith Colleges, and the University of Massachusetts Amherst. The campuses have been cooperating for more than 50 years along uh, what I consider to be two parallel paths of collaboration. One of sharing resources so that whenever possible, uh, each campus makes available to students from the other four campuses that which it has available to students from its own campus. And also combining resources with the idea being that as a group, uh, the campuses can accomplish things that they may not be able to accomplish uh, individually. I think the best example of sharing reg, uh, resources is our cross-registration program through which students can take courses at any of the other four campuses at no additional charge and the credits are fully transferable back to their home campus. And as you can see, uh, we try to make it as easy as possible for students to take advantage of this program. Uh, other examples of sharing resources are the fact that our theater productions and dance productions have open auditions so students from all five campuses can try out for these. Uh, also, extracurriculars, concerts, and social activities are uh, almost always open to all five college students. And when it comes to combining resources, there's many, many examples of the campuses working together. We have uh, joint departments in dance and astronomy and joint majors in architecture and film studies. Now, um, these are all available individually on our member campuses, but the faculty members involved recognize that by pooling their resources, they can offer their students a far richer experience. There's also times though when students are interested in studying an area that uh, our campuses may not have as a major or as a minor. For those situations, we've created the five college certificate program through which a student can work with a faculty advisor to develop a course of study and then carry it out by taking courses, usually on multiple campuses, um, ending with earning a certificate, which is the equivalent of an academic minor to go, go along with their major when they graduate. Another example of combining resources is the Five College Center for World Languages, where students can study more than 40 less commonly taught languages to prepare themselves for study abroad, research, or even for speaking heritage languages uh, at home or with their friends. And finally, an example of uh, combining resources is we try to create as many opportunities as possible throughout the year for students to share what they're doing with other students, with faculty members, and with the community at large. Uh, we have many um, performances uh, of students, as well as uh, academic symposia at which students can present the research that they've been working on. I hope that gives you a sense of uh, what the Five College Consortium can offer to students who enroll in one of our member campuses. I am going to turn things over now to the Dean of Admissions from Amherst College, Kate Zolkos. Hi, everyone. Oh, my gosh. I so wish that we could be with you in person. This is very frustrating talking about computer screen in my son's bedroom, which if you're unlucky, you'll be able to see in a few minutes if my video goes kind of wonky. But anyway, let me tell you a little bit about Amherst to get started. So Amherst was founded 200 years ago and enrolls about 1,850 students from 48 states plus DC, Puerto Rico, and 54 countries. 48% of our students identify as students of color why another 10% are non-US citizens and 5% on top of that are dual citizens with the US and another country. Amherst is a liberal arts college. Our student to faculty ratio is seven to one. Amherst faculty do all the teaching as well as all the academic advising. We offer an open curriculum, which means there are neither distribution requirements nor a core curriculum. Instead, students choose the courses that matter the most to them, which ensures that each classroom is filled with inquisitive, fully engaged students committed to the topic being discussed. Students are required to take a first year seminar and to complete a major. So both in the classroom and the residence halls, we work very hard to create an inclusive environment which allows for meaningful relationships among students from different backgrounds with unique experiences and perspectives. Amherst offers many research opportunities for students across disciplines. Just two years ago, disability in mind, we opened a new science center, obviously, um, to, to provide state-of-the-art facilities and, and uh, flexible space to, to support and facilitate interdisciplinary partnerships in the sciences at Amherst. Another thing to note is housing is guaranteed for all four years. So almost everyone, about 90% of our students live, well, in usual years, 
in one of 34 residential buildings with 10 to 125 students. One of my favorite about when I'm talking about Amherst is our financial aid. Amherst offers generous financial aid. We're need blinding the admission process for all students, both domestic and international. We meet 100% of demonstrated need for all admitted students with no packaged loans. This policy holds true for the very first student we admit in early decision to the last student we admit, again, regardless of citizenship. And we want to do great things in the world. The Loeb Center for Career Planning and Exploration works closely with students throughout their four years, offering career advising, internship opportunities, as well as connecting students with alumni across industries and around the world. Last but not least, I encourage you to learn more about the admission process and financial aid here. You can shoot messages to um, the question and answers, or you can feel free to email, email us or phone us if you have any other questions. Now on to our wonderful colleague, Fumio, who will tell us. Thank you, Kate. Hi, I'm Fumio Sugihara. I'm Dean of Admissions and Financial Aid at New Hampshire College. And um, what I'd like to start with is, uh, we don't have a lot of time, but I think we start with our history. Hampshire was started by the four other institutions um, as a means of driving higher education innovation forward. And we have stayed true to that mission um, to, to, to really expand what it is that we think higher ed can be and can provide our students in the form of a liberal arts education. And um, we are the smallest of the five colleges. Um, and what we offer is the ability for students to come to Hampshire and engage in an unbounded environment where they are challenged to see the intersections between uh, disciplines um, to really create new knowledge. Um, because of that, our students tend to be entrepreneurial by nature, they tend to be innovation innovators, and they tend to really be um, want to see creative solutions. But on the other side of that is that they demand critical responses to what's happening in our world today. And so even though Hampshire um, started 50 years ago as an innovator, we were also challenged to, to meet the urgent demands of society at large and to apply how the liberal arts um, can be used to confront those, um, those, those issues. And, and we've done that for a long time in the form of small classes um, and naturally with the, you know, with our students also having the ability to benefit from the five colleges as, as Kevin has described. Um, we offer a campus which is, um, you know, you can see behind me is the Kern Center um, where students study what we do. This is a, one of 22 uh, living buildings in the country. Um, so our commitment to sustainability is very strong, but more important is that this is not just a, a place where my office is, but it's a place where our students study and they learn. The, the gray water system is, uh, is the background for major scientific studies, um, as are the way that we use the space. And we encourage that level of creative thinking and interdisciplinary thinking in everything that we do um, at, at Hampshire College. So again, not, not enough time to fully go into everything I would love to, but send us questions. But with that, it is my privilege to introduce Lakia Newland, Dean of Admissions from Mount Holyoke College. Thanks, Fumio. All right, everybody. As you heard, my name is Lakia Newland, and I serve as Dean of Admission at Mount Holyoke College, and I use she, her pronouns. So I'll give you a little bit of background context about Mount Holyoke as well. We were founded in 1837 as the first of seven sister colleges at a time where there were no college options for women. Our founder, Mary Lyon, was a pioneer and a visionary, and Mount Holyoke quickly became a model upon which many other women's colleges were patterned. We have a historic legacy of educating future leaders. We seek to admit students who are ready to take intellectual risks and who are unafraid of upholding the spirit of social justice that has been woven into the fabric of the institution since its inception. Today, Mount Holyoke is a gender diverse and gender affirming institution that welcomes applications from female, transgender, and non-binary students. You might already know that delivering an exceptional academic experience is at the top of the list of what we do well. We attract world-class faculty and students because we're different. 
we're forward thinking and cognizant of the common good. Our students are smart and highly engaged. They value close mentorship, research opportunities, and experiential learning. Through our LINK initiative, each Mount Holyoke student is fully funded for a summer internship or research experience before they graduate, either in the US or abroad. We connect students with mentors and role models through faculty and the college's powerful network of 38,000 alums. Mount Holyoke's collaborative classroom environment, never cutthroat, small student to faculty ratio, nine to one, and 75% of the classes being smaller than 20 students ensures that all students have a voice. We offer 48 majors in a rich array of community-based learning classes and curriculum to career opportunities through our innovative Nexus program. Computer science is currently our most popular major, closely followed by biology, English, psychology, international relations, and economics. 36% of our students major in the STEM fields, 35% in social sciences, and 28 in humanities. Among American baccalaureate colleges, Mount Holyoke produces the greatest number of women going on to earn STEM doctorates. So just a little bit of background there, much more to discuss. Happy to answer your questions and I'm gonna pass it to my colleague, Deanna at Smith College. Thank you, Kia. <clears throat> As Kia mentioned, uh, I'm Deanna Dixon, uh, Dean of Admission at Smith College. Smith is one of the largest liberal arts colleges for women with about 2,500 undergraduate students. At Smith, your students' ambition is activated. There is nothing to hold students back. We trust our students to set their own paths, to be audacious, to have courage, to express themselves and find their way in the world. One way we do this is by providing students freedom and flexibility to choose courses in our open curriculum. There are no core course requirements at Smith. Outside of requirements for the major and one required writing intensive course, students take responsibility for their education under the guidance of liberal arts advisors. So they use the open curriculum in a thoughtful and intentional way. Though we are strong across the curriculum, about 40% of students major in a STEM field at Smith. We have shown the value we place on women's education by being the first women's college to create our own accredited engineering program, one of only two in the country. Smith offers many opportunities to be involved in research in STEM and across all disciplines. All students at Smith uh, also have the opportunity to experience a Smith funded internship, which means all students can be paid for what would otherwise be unpaid work. Smith's unique housing system helps to create community across different class years. Our students live among 41 self-governing houses, not your typical dorm, where all class years live together, traditions are honored, friendships are formed, and leadership is developed. Community is also formed by our several uh, cultural organizations, athletics, uh, and in over 140 student organizations. Smith is a community of leaders, with a legacy of activism and social justice. We welcome students who want to raise their voice or be inspired to do so from students around them. Women's colleges provide the space for students to become risk takers, to feel that their contributions to class are valued, to develop their voice by speaking up and speaking out and not apologizing for it. I look forward to answering your questions a little later, and now I will pass things over to Mike Drish, who's Director of First Year Admissions at University of Massachusetts Amherst. Thank you, Deanna. And I also wanna extend my welcome to everyone. Like, like Kate, I wish that we were all in person able to connect today, but I'm really glad we're able to do this virtually. Um, as you heard from uh, Deanna's introduction, um, my name is Mike Drish, and I'm with the University of Massachusetts Amherst, or UMass Amherst. We're a public flagship university dedicated to making a profound transformative impact to the common good. We were founded in 1863 and today are the largest public research university in New England. And we are distinguished by excellence and the breadth of our academic research and undergraduate student population. And today I'd like to talk about two of those briefly. One is our, the UMass academic experience. Um, we are a little bit different from our five college um, partners, we have over 100 majors in 10 different colleges, 
but it's not just the vast academic and research possibilities that set UMass apart. We also offer a variety of learning environments from small class settings to large lecture halls with discussion sections. But rest assured, over 80% of our courses have 40 or fewer students. So we first and foremost value undergraduate education and ensuring that students build connections with their fellow classmates and the faculty teaching them in the classroom. In each of those settings I mentioned, students are educated by faculty who are here to teach, but they're also finding ways to make an impact in their fields. 12 UMass Amherst faculty are among the world's most highly cited researchers, and that makes us a research powerhouse. Um, and so as early as their first year, students are involved in real world-changing research, partially because they're getting to know faculty who are leading those centers and institutes across campus that are connected with governments and non-government agencies and industry to, um, to investigate and explore opportunities connected to research. And all of this, as you've heard from some of, of the other five colleges, leads to an entrepreneurial spirit. All of us are in Massachusetts. Massachusetts is an innovative place. It's an innovative state. And we have a long history of partnering with industry to bring research to the marketplace. Um, so those are a few ways that the academic experience at UMass is distinguishable. And then I want to talk just very briefly about the student community. We are home to a diverse, welcoming, supportive community of 22,000 undergrads, so just a little bit bigger than the other members of the five college consortium. The majority of those students do come from all across Massachusetts, but about one fourth of them do come from outside of Massachusetts. Of our undergraduate students, 21% of them are the first in their family to attend a four year university or first generation. 30% of them are from historically underrepresented racial or ethnic groups and 27% of them are from low socioeconomic backgrounds. One thing this diverse group of students has in common is they all chose UMass, and they are all scholars. For example, we are one of the nation's top producing research universities for Fulbright scholars. So there's a wide range of resources that ensure student success and that students thrive at UMass and graduate in four years. We also have a large, supportive residential community, something that is not common at large public universities, and 100% of our first year students live on campus. So as a large diverse campus community, we're continuously working to improve relations between students from so many backgrounds. We strive for every student to feel welcome and comfortable in an environment where they feel safe. There are a number of initiatives that are happening on campus right now um, to connect students virtually to ensure that that's happening. So I'm really happy to be here today, looking forward to the dialogue and your questions. Um, thank you. I think I hand it now back to Kevin. Thanks so much, Mike. So yeah, this is the, the question and answer uh, portion of our presentation. And um, many of you sent in questions ahead of time. And so uh, I'm going to read off the first one, which is um, has to do with uh, uh, changes that campuses have made to the admissions process uh, in response to the pandemic. Um, Mike, could you respond to that? How our campuses have, have made uh, changes in their admissions process? Yeah, absolutely. Now that my voice is warmed up, I might as well keep going, right? So that, <laughs> that works well. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. And sure. really good question. Obviously, it's on all of our minds. And we strike that balance of talking about our institutions as they are in a typical environment but then at the same time we're in nothing nothing is typical right now so i can definitely talk about what the five colleges have done related to um kind of what's happening in the world around us the first thing that that everyone um kind of on the webinar should know is that all of us i think had a, just a great response to um, an unparalleled situation many of our campuses moved either to completely virtual to a hybrid model in some cases um and so the the virtual kind of the movement to virtual i think that most of us could agree this past spring was quick it was swift most places were not prepared for that and i think that a lot of our students and faculty would admit that it was a little haphazard in some ways but starting this fall since we knew that we'd be coming back in either a virtual or a hybrid model all of our campuses did an excellent job preparing to ensure that students and the faculty would be engaged that there would be a lot that they got out of the experience um, I know I can, I can tell you from UMass's perspective, I heard, have heard from a wide variety of parents of first year students who have actually admitted, they, they've kind of observed their students' classes and they've said it was much better than they were expecting it to be virtually. So I think that we've made some, some really good strides to ensure that we 
um, are able to offer our incredible academic experience virtually and ensure that students are best served by that um, as much as possible, no matter what their background, no matter what access they have, trying to find ways to ensure that students have that access. I am comfortable in saying that you and your students to all of our, our CBO partners, that you can count on all of us to put students' best interests at the center of our decisions. As I mentioned, as the COVID situation unfurled, we moved swiftly, courses are online, we re reoriented courses, we provided financial assistance to those students in need. And one thing that all of us do is we're all test optional. And so thinking about the admission process, um, we, some of the members of the five colleges, such as Smith and Mount Holyoke, have been test optional for 10 to 20 years. Others, like UMass Amherst, we're in our first year of being test optional. The good news is all of us um, review holistically. And so testing is not one piece of the puzzle. It's one of many parts that we look at. Some of us have more years of looking at it without testing, and others are a little newer to it, but we will, we are all test optional. That means students should never take the test for any of the five colleges that is unnecessary and not something that they need to do. And that kind of leads me to this idea that flexibility is the name of the game this year. We don't live in a bubble. As beautiful as Amherst is and Western Mass, we don't live in a bubble. We're affected by COVID. And we know that all of you and your students have been as well. And so that means if we see pass fail grades from the spring semester or even this year into the senior year, Obviously, if we see different obstacles or challenges that students um, have had to overcome related to COVID, um, things that are beyond their control, availability of courses, we are not going to penalize the student. We just need them to tell their story, give us good insight into that, and help us understand <clears throat> the situation that they've faced. So at the end of the day, the response to COVID, students will not be disadvantaged in our admission process because of changes to grades or academics or limitations related to clubs or activities. Um, possible additional work experience, helping support their family, support for senior citizens, or say assistance with other things that have come about as a result of the pandemic, such as helping with food delivery, contributing to their family in many different ways, um, to helping support siblings and their educational pursuits. Those family contributions, that con contribution to the greater good is very much important, and that will be considered highly in the admission process. So Students should tell their story, know that we're very open-minded. We want to hear what this past, you know, roughly year or so has been like, um, in addition to the years prior to that. And then know that our campuses have all adjusted in a student-centric way to ensure that students are supported, they have access to what they need from all walks of life and all backgrounds. And I think that we're doing, making the best of a really tough situation right now. Um, and so that's something that we all have in common. So I hope that helps answer that question. Thanks for asking. Thank you, Mike. Um, another question that, that uh, came in ahead of time um, has to do with how the campuses are addressing racism and um, how are you ensuring that students feel welcome and comfortable on your campuses? Um, Kia, could you answer that one? Sure. Thanks so much, Kevin. Um, so first and foremost, each of our campuses acknowledges that there are twin pandemics taking place right now, one caused by COVID-19 and the other by racism and all the ways in which it is so insidiously woven into the fabric of American life. This is why each of our campuses has made public our anti-racism action plans. We all know that words without action don't mean much, so we're working every day at what it means to be anti-racist. We also know that we will never arrive. We won't ever be able to say, my school is anti-racist because there is no final destination. You won't, we, we, we all know that you don't arrive at being anti-racist and that the work has to be done every single day. Uh, and that as institutions, we all have to continue to challenge ourselves to do that work. So for those of you who maybe had the privilege of viewing the annual NACAC conference this year, the closing speaker was Dr. Michael Sorrell, the president of Paul Quinn College in Austin, Texas. Uh, and there was something that Dr. Sorrell said that stuck with me ever since. And it was, give or take something like this, anti-racist policies are great, we need them, but anti-racist people are better, hire them. So I think what Dr. Sorrell was trying to say there was that we need to hire people who embody the mindset that we want our institutions to emulate with action. 
And I'm really proud to be on a panel with leaders who emulate anti-racist thinking and behavior. What we represent carries out into the offices we each lead. Each of our campuses remains deeply committed to supporting our students, staff, and faculty as we move ahead in our attempts to be better anti-racist. So let me give you a few highlights from the Valley. Today, Mount, Ho today, Mount Holyoke's biochemistry and chemistry faculty and staff are hosting their first community conversation about building support for BIPOC students studying in their department. At UMass Amherst, their Center for, for Multicultural Advancement and Student Success has forged a racial justice coalition focused on achieving a racially just and oppression-free environment. At Amherst, they too have already begun to focus on students in STEM with an initiative called Being Human in STEM or HSTEM. The initiative aims to foster a more inclusive, so, sorry about the lawnmower in the background, supportive STEM community by helping students, faculty, and staff collaboratively develop a framework to understand and navigate diverse identities in the classroom, in labs, and beyond. I guess this is live TV and COVID world, right? And at Smith, they're focusing on the words of scholar and author Michelle Alexander, who wrote, we cannot solve a problem we do not understand. So Smith is educating and acting simultaneously, whether it be a book club to unpack Brian Stevenson's Just Mercy or a class for students, staff and faculty called Thinking Through Race, they're engaging the history of race in America, its intersection with other identities and its impact on the world today. And last but not least, I have to end my comments with speaking about Hampshire by the very nature of its inception and existence, Hampshire stands for everything all of our schools hope to be. If you want to get a sense of how deep the commitment to racial justice is at Hampshire, all you have to do is peruse their website to see highlights of conversations with James Baldwin, who served as a visiting professor in 1984. Or you could read about Hampshire's history and founding in the New College Plan, a report that called to question all of our assumptions about the liberal arts and liberal arts education and also led to, to Hampshire's founding. This is a reason why, Ham there is a reason rather, why Hampshire stands as the nation's higher education leader in rejecting standardized testing. So I'm gonna be bold there and say they're beyond test optional, they reject it, right? And again, if you were privileged enough to view the NACAC session last week, you may have heard um, author Kendi, Ibram Kendi uh, who wrote how to be an anti-racist say, can we truly be anti-racist if we're prioritizing standardized test scores and admission? So all of that to say, in short, I think Hampshire exists to turn on its head what we think we know. And as I said earlier, I'm really proud to be among a team of leaders willing to do just that. Yeah, thank you so much. Excellent answer. Um, another question that has come into us um, has to do with building community. Um, how do our campuses embrace students from different backgrounds and ensure that they thrive on our campuses? Deanna, could you answer that one? Hi, I am happy to answer that question. And I think maybe like you, Kia, Tuesdays are the landscaping day because just at this moment, right? <laughs> I have a big lawnmower outside my window, so I think I'm gonna speak up a little bit, so I hope that you can um, hear me. Uh, thank you for asking about uh, community. I'm going to try to capture a, a sense of how our um, students from different backgrounds are, uh, or how they thrive uh, in our communities, really from the smallest of us, which is about 1,400 undergraduates, to the largest, uh, UMass, at almost, uh, I think, you know, 15 or um, 5,000 plus, I think, students in the first year class, we all provide resources and support that help our students thrive on our campuses. Thriving academically is one thing, and we all provide academic support for all students, but we also aim to provide campus environments where students feel they are welcomed and where they belong. Um, we value diverse campuses. We know and understand that a student body comprised of different student backgrounds create communities that contribute significantly to everyone's experience academically and beyond the curriculum. Race, ethnicity, class, gender, 
gender expression, sexual orientation, religious expression, physical ability, political expression, so much make up our identities and we all aim to provide communities that are inclusive and welcoming of these identities. We value a commitment to anti-racism, anti-oppression, social justice, respectful discourse and engagement. The curricular and co-curricular experiences, residential spaces, clubs, and organizations on our campuses provide ways for students to bring their authentic selves to our communities. Though we recognize it is not always easy our centers or offices that have multicultural affairs or a multicultural advancement in their title help to support students whose identities intersect in a variety of combinations, including first generation, BIPOC, uh, low income. Our cultural centers provide affinity spaces and the home away from home that many students value and give them confidence of self-expression so they can be their authentic selves. Student conceived and student run organizations contribute here as well. For some of us, traditions can epitomize community and help students thrive. Traditions bond students together and create lasting memories. This is especially true, I must say, of the women's colleges, where our strong alumni network also helps students thrive by providing a connection to life post college, uh, encouragement to persist, and, well, career and job connections too. Uh, our communities also support, uh, include support for LGBTQ students whose identification uh, also spans the gender spectrum. And I'll include, you know, Smith and Mount Holyoke here too. Um, I suggest that if you have questions about application policies pertaining to transgender students interested in Mount Holyoke or Smith that you, um, might ask us uh, individually. I think we have uh, some nuances in terms of our um, application policy. So uh, it certainly is worth um, being in touch with us, maybe offline if, if that might pertain to uh, any of your students. Uh, thank you for the chance to answer this question and I'll, I think I'm turning it back to Kevin. Thanks so much, Deanna. Um, our next question, uh, I'm going to see if Fumio would like to answer this, and it has to do with return on investment. Um, everybody knows that the cost of higher education uh, does keep going up. And so what could we say about how uh, an education at our campuses can help prepare students um, for the job market, for the world, for life? Uh, thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Um... And that's, a, I mean, that's such an important question in this, um, in this time. And, um, and so where I'd like to begin is that it, it, it's about outcomes and, and families, you know, want three things from, from you know, three primary things from their college or universities, families and students. They want a safe environment. And I mean, you all know the safe environment acquire real world marketable skills and, and have the confidence that the college will meet uh, individual students' aspirations. Um, these are usually in this, in this order, um, but they're, I, I, they're not static things. And, and for example, um, real world marketable skills. Um, for, for, for most of our institutions, those have changed over the decade. I, for, for one of our institutions, Amherst, they've changed over the centuries. Um, and it's as, um, as we've had advances with technology, um, you know, the skills, um, they actually change quite frequently. Um, and, and that's where we believe, and that's where the liberal arts is such a, a, a bedrock. Um, and as the bedrock of education in the United States, it's, it's been in our hands to both offer the opportunities to provide students with those necessary skills, to be able to, um, to secure employment, um, and also to, um, to, you know, in some part, these educations provide the means in which um, the economy and the, the environment in which those skills are needed changes and adapts or becomes new. Um, and so that's, and, and that might seem like really kind of like far flung and out there, but it's, it, it really isn't. Um, you know, for example, at Hampshire, um, you know, as, as, as we've noted, the, the, the challenge for us is to have students create new knowledge. Um, and, and that's, you know, 
a lot of why, to be honest, why I'm here today is, um, you know, as some of us have seen, Hampshire has had some troubles. And, but the fact is that these colleges believe so profoundly in this idea of providing an education that's meaningful for all of our students, um, that through these crises, they have continued um, and are supporting us as we try to, again, innovate the education and offer this new perspective on what the liberal arts can be to meet the current demands of students. That's not something that is happening in isolation of Hampshire, it's happening at Hampshire because of these five colleges uh, uh, explicitly. Um, so the, the, and that's why the other colleges created us. Um, so, so this is demonstrated in the research. Um, you know, think about what's happened today with COVID-19. There, there are UMass faculty and students actively engaged in, um, in really doing, trying to understand the, the pathways through which this, this virus moves. We have faculty on our campus who have incorporated um, the studies about the sociological, the economic impacts of the pandemic into their work to make sure that our students are relevant and actually see the connections between what's happening in our classrooms and what's happening outside so that they can take this into their professional lives. Um, in, but, you know, so, so that's the, the, the really big picture. Um, and the you know, our individual institutions are also committed with providing that intellectual development, um, but also we want to make sure that students have those practical skills and they have those connections. And so, you know, met, all of us have centers on campus dedicated to providing students with advising and insight about career paths and opportunities. Um, we have alumni networks and portals where students can log in and interact with students. We have um, alumni um, in residence, um, where, where students really get to know a, a, an individual working in a career. Um, UMass has um, like 20,000 employers <laughs> across 60 industries um, come to their campus to post internships and fellowships um, for, for their students. And, and our campuses share networks uh, with databases for internships and job opportunities. So our students are not just plugging into our individual networks of our alums, as, as Deanna has already mentioned, but they're also making new connections and they're branching out and they're learning about the new fields, the new work that's out there. Um, because as we all know that the, the, the rate of technological difference or, or change is so rapid that it's also single-handedly changing the nature of what the students are gonna be doing in the future. And so not only do our students have to have the skills, they have to have the, those competencies, um, along with the competencies that come with the liberal arts education of the analytic skills, the ability to, um, to critically think through a problem, the, the rhetorical skills or the ability to communicate and make a powerful argument towards a set point, um, the capacity to make a decision based on the information, both qualitative and quantitative that's available to them. Um, this is what happens in our, our classrooms. And, and, and a lot of places do this, but, but what are the places that do this better? Um, and these are the places that are committed to small classes. Um, and so the, the five colleges, UMass included, has really committed ourselves to small classes, to environments, where our students are engaging the faculty um, so that not only do they get these skills that I've mentioned and these competencies, but when they leave these places, they have the, what I consider the missing element, which is the confidence um, to be successful, to, to sit in those intense meetings, to sit in those really difficult conversations, forge their own ideas in a compelling and informed way and make a passionate request for um, why they think their organization or they um, should move in a certain direction. So it's not just the competencies, it's also the confidence of being in environments like these that challenge and push students towards, um, towards the outcomes they, they desire. Um, so again, I can go on about this, but I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna turn it back to Kevin. Um, but if anyone wants to talk more about this, just let us know. Hey, thanks so much, Fumio. Uh, let's see, let's see if Kate, uh, if you could answer this uh, question we have about academics. Could you just touch on, um, you know, some of the, the high points of the faculty and the research and the classes that our uh, individual campuses offer? 
Sure. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I should have changed my background now to show the view of the Pioneer Valley, but you can see some of the background. We live in an extraordinary place where, where the bucolic geographic setting is kind of breathtaking, especially with the fall foliage is changing. And out my window, I can see reds and yellows and greens. And yet we have such rich academic offer. Um, Fumi, I'm going to look for a thumbs up. It looks like my internet's unstable. Can you still hear me? You can all still hear me. Um, well, each of our institutions is totally autonomous. Together, we are stronger. We're stronger because of our differences, which, which create breadth to options for students and to our faculty. Because of the consortium, our students will have many thousands of classes in which to, consi which to consider across the staggering breadth of options. If they attend Hampshire, Smith, Mount Holyoke or Amherst, they will experience the close, close colloquy of a small college experience with the resources of a large university. Or flip that around, as there are myriad options consistent with a larger university, yet with a small college intimacy available too. Students, as Kevin said, can cross register and take advantage of classes, class campuses. Faculty also, it's really important to note, can collaborate across institutions within the framework of their academic investigations. To add yet another dimension, the five colleges hire five college professors too, who are not restricted to teaching at one campus, but might teach at Smith this semester, Mount Holyoke next semester, UMass, Hampshire, Amherst, and so on. You've heard a bit about each college, but let me provide some more detail and share with you some of the more popular classes and in this case, I'm going to say popularity is measured by five college cross enrollment. So at Amherst last fall, a five college professor taught an astronomy class that focused on observations and techniques. Another very popular course among five college students is Japanese 101, team taught by two Amherst professors. Hampshire attracts students from the other four institutions to take America's classes, as well as a class in graphic design studio. Five college students make their way past Amherst, past Hampshire, to take edu education classes at Mount Holyoke College, as well as attending an African studies class. And just across the Connecticut River, students are jazzed to take dance classes at Smith, specifically in improv, African dance, and ballet. When I attended graduate school at UMass, my absolute hands-down favorite class was taught by the then chancellor. And he actually continues to teach and is teaching a class at UMass examining the history of college sports. Another popular class that draws students from the other four colleges to UMass focuses on philosophy and public schools. Students who leave their home campus to take a class across town or even over the Holyoke Range or across the Connecticut River tend to be highly motivated and add a rich perspective and energy to the class they're enrolled in. At the same time, it's important to note that students in the home institution have priority. So students will not be shut out of classes on their own campus because of five college students. There are clubs and extracurricular activities on each of the five college campuses that are open to all five college students, which allows for even greater sense of community and collaboration. Again, we're happy to address any um, individually through the chat or um, for all of us. Kevin, thank you. Thank you, Kate. Uh, a follow-up uh, question to, to Kate's excellent presentation is um, has to do with uh, how easy is it for students to do, you know, take advantage of the opportunities that, that Kate was laying out and, and how do they do that? And I, as I touched on a little bit in one of my slides, uh, there's a, a bus system that goes between the campuses. Um, during the day, during the week, the, the buses run every 15 to 20 minutes. Um, but the buses also run well into the evening and on the weekends so that students can not only get from campus to campus to take classes and take advantage of extracurriculars, but also to get to downtowns and to shopping centers um, you know, when they're not in school. Uh, so, and the, the bus is free. Uh, it's been uh, uh, running continually uh, for the past 40 years and we have a great relationship with the local bus system. Um, and so we try to make it as easy as possible through the bus system. And also if a student is on meal plan on their home campus, 
uh, and they have a, a, a class at around mealtime on one of the other campuses, they can arrange to um, have their meal on that other campus charged back to their meal plan on their home campus. Um, and so thanks to these uh, steps we've taken to make it as easy as possible, um, up to about 5,000 courses are taken each year by students going from campus to campus. Um, I'm gonna continue on with some of the questions now. And um, I think it might be a good time for Fumio to uh, take a moment to talk about how Hampshire has addressed the challenges that uh, it's been encountering uh, over the past year or so. Thank you, Kevin. Um, this is, well, some of you might not know, I, I joined Hampshire in March of this year, um, specifically to, to work with Ed Wingenbach, our, our new president, on, um, on, on how, to, how to move Hampshire into a more sustainable uh, place. But before I started, um, President Wingenbach, along with the Board of Trustees, had, had already put into motion a, a considerable effort um, in terms of uh, a campaign to generate $60 million, which we are on our way towards. Um, it's over a five-year period. Um, and as well as starting to uh, rebuild the admissions operations so that we can recruit a class. And, and we, were, we were able to bring in a class of uh, 125 students, 120 students um, for, for this year. And, um, and, and, and it's been exciting to, to see them, um, to have them be on campus and uh, taking part in uh, admissions events and, um, and and being a part of the campus community. Um, as some of you know, um, we, we are on campus. Um, and uh, and so so we, we we do believe that the the outlook, you know, although it's not, you know, I'm not gonna ever paint that this is a, a rosy picture, um, but there are clear steps forward and we have made progress towards uh, towards being sustainable. And, and you'll also note that we've been very transparent about, about where we stand and the situation on the college. Um, and uh, I think Dalton noted in the, um, in the response that, you know, the, the president convenes weekly, has, has convened weekly meetings um, and has been very um, communicative with the staff and really drawing on the, the faculty and staff to, to help guide us through this, um, this, this landscape that has been complicated by the pandemic. Um, but, but, you know, we are resolved and, um, and we are uh, on a positive trajectory. So um, again, uh, but I, I do wanna say that that is because of the five colleges. Um, when we went through this period of time, there's an enormous amount of support um, offered to Hampshire from the five college, uh, the other four colleges um, to ensure that we could move forward. And because of that, um, we are well positioned and we are in a stronger position and we do have the opportunity to continue to provide the innovations on, the, on higher education um, that, 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 that we feel um, we, we have to offer. So, so I, I'd be glad to also talk more about this individually. Uh, Dalton put my email in the chat, so feel free to contact me directly, and I'd be glad to talk more about this. So, um, but thank you for this time. Thank you, Fumio. Uh, another question that we have that came in um, uh, is if each of the uh, campuses could talk briefly about the LGBTQ communities on your campus. And let's go in reverse alphabetical order. So Mike, if you could start off by talking about UMass. Absolutely, thanks, Kevin. And thank you for this questioning. This was a really great question to see in the chat. Um, one of the things that, that I'd like to point out, um, UMass Amherst, obviously like, like all of the five colleges, we're a very progressive um, student environment. Um, we, we value students of all backgrounds and identities. Deanna um, from Smith did an excellent job talking about that. <clears throat> a few highlights specific to UMass on this point. Um, we are consistently ranked by Campus Pride as one of the top 30 colleges or universities for LGBTQI students in the United States. That's been almost a decade where we've been in the, that upper echelon of, of that ranking. Um, part of the reason for that is we are home to one of the nation's first LGBTQI campus resource centers, fully staffed by um, those, those staff that are so important in helping to build community. We also were um, the university, first university in the nation 
um, to have a residence hall for LGBTQI and ally student populations on campus. Um, and we also have led the way with over 200 plus gender inclusive single user restrooms and streamlining um, name and um, other kind of elements in our registration process, student identity systems on campus to ensure that students are able to, to, to it, the, the name reflects that student or that individual. So those are a few things that have made UMass um, kind of stand out in terms of support for our LGBTQI um, students. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Deanna, could you uh, uh, talk a little bit about Smith? Yeah, the, the way I'd like to um, answer that question is uh, really from, you know, a, a women's college environment. And I say that because we have an environment that we describe as, you know, welcoming. And by having a welcoming environment, what that means is that students who um, identify across the gender spectrum or across sexual orientation um, are welcomed into the community without feeling like they have to uh, justify or defend or have an, a, a piece of their identity really be a, a burden to their education. So to, by removing those um, barriers, it allows students to, as I mentioned in my earlier uh, remark, uh, really be their authentic selves. So part of that resource on campus is, is really widespread. Uh, you know, it ranges from uh, our resource center for uh, sexuality and gender. It goes, uh, reaches into, um, you know, uh, uh, our, um, including uh, pronouns when um, students identify themselves or, or the, in the community as a whole, not just students. It is uh, the respect that is given to students to be who they, who they are. So, um, so to me, the resources on campus really are not just focused in some kind of a, um, a, a center or organization because those do exist. It is the, the community um, uh, as a whole that provides an environment where um, an individual can, can be comfortable with who they are without having to be mindful of that uh, at all times and to you know, pursue their education um, you know, in, in, in the way that, that is important to them. So that's, that's really the best way that I like to answer a question like that, because um, I think for women's colleges, we tend to be uh, known as, as environments that, uh, where people can be themselves uh, from all walks of life. Thanks so much, Deanna. Uh, Kia, could you talk a little bit about Mount Holyoke? Sure. So, you know, it may sound like I'm belaboring the same points that my colleague Deanna just said, but I concur completely. Uh, I think we just posted in the chat our resource page, but as you'll see for yourself that we have a ton of resources and support to help students find community on campus if they are a part of the LGBTQIA community. Uh, everything from living learning communities uh, where students can live together around a central theme that may um, encompass their gender identity or sexuality. Uh, clubs and organizations. Uh, we have one of our cultural centers, the Jeanette Marx Cultural Center, or Mar Marx House, as we call it on campus. Um, a slew of clubs and organizations from Familia to Femme Powered. Uh, the list goes on and on and on. But ultimately, I think the point is that um, all of our schools are highly ranked for being supportive institutions for students who come from uh, various backgrounds, including anyone on the gender spectrum. Uh, and I think that that's just part of the fabric of who we are uh, and um, that, you know, the best bet for you to see if, if you agree is to not take our word for it as, as, you know, the representatives for our institutions, but to see for yourself what we have. And if you think there's something missing to be in touch with us to, to inquire further, um, but I won't uh, drone on and on because I know that time is running short and you got at least one more of us to go through, uh, but for sure, check out our resources. Thanks, Kia. Fumio, could you talk about Hampshire College? Sure, and um, you know, I, I'm not gonna be able to do, I mean, kind of like, like Kia, I'm not gonna be able to do justice to, to everything that um, uh, happens at, at, at Hampshire, um, 
but what what I and and what I will say is that um, I wouldn't be surprised if um, most Hampshire students or or many Hampshire students more than half um, identify with uh, LGBTQIA uh, perspectives and um, and that the majority of our campus are very if not are very strong ardent supporters. Um, you'll find that in the form of, I mean, we, there's one of the, the, we offer, we, we've, I think for a while we've had, um, uh, the five, we've hosted, um, the, the five college queer gender sexuality studies conference, which uh, our students, I think, I think 10 years ago went to a conference and were so inspired that they, they came back and rather than just report back, they, they made this thing. Um, which is a beacon for many students, um, and and it's a well-known uh, program with within the communities. Um, so 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 th there's a lot of things that you'll find at our campuses, um, and and ways that we we come together. Like as I noted, that even though that uh, event was started at Hampshire, it's a five college thing. And I mean, it really identifies uh, across these institutions. Um, and and it's a it's a significant event, um, uh, you know that that people from afar come to be a part of and learn from and grow from. So so there's the resources, there's the community um, that that you know Hampshire offers and the the clubs and we have centers um, similar to what has been described. But but I would I would add that there is the the energy and activism. Um, around um, the LGBTQIAA issues and concerns, um, both political, societal, um, and, and, and personal, that um, does really animate our students in, in a significant way, um, and in a way that they, they, they want to um, do events along the lines of, of informing our community um, and, um, and, and informing others. And, and it's not to say that, you know, we're perfect by any way. I mean, I think Hampshire aspires to be a place that is inclusive and open, um, but we realize that that has to come with very deep introspection. Um, and so the challenge for us isn't necessarily to say we do all these wonderful things, but it is to say, do we have the ability to look into ourselves to, to change and to grow as the needs and, and of, of our broader society change and grow Around issues similar to LGBTQIA or or race or class, um, you know, as as Lakia noted in 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 her in her uh, answer to the to a previous question. So there's a lot there, and I, I'm going to stop at I'm going to stop here, but um, but encourage you to really look into that um, that the 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 uh, the five college event on on our campus. Thank you, Fumio, um, and Kate. Could you talk a little bit about Amherst College? Sure, thank you. I, know, I am noticing that the time is, oh my gosh, the time is almost up. And I, I, if I had my video on, you could see my head nodding as all of my colleagues were, were talking. Um, Fumia mentioned energy and activism, and that is something that is clearly present on all of our campus campuses. Um, we have LGBT theme housing now. Um, we have a very active queer resource center uh, just um, at, added the, the link um, to the LGBTQ page on our website. Um, our mission is to really further conversation to raise awareness across campus. And I think the humility that Fumio suggests and that Kia mentioned earlier is, you know, not, not, we're, we're not where we want to be yet, but we're working there um, to raise awareness again across campus and to empower and support all students. The five college community also provides a larger network between campuses and I think our hope in presenting today is that when you're talking with students, you can see that this collaboration that we all have um, is something that really does help us um, present a stronger opportunity for students, both academically, but also socially, and in other ways that we haven't even mentioned yet today. So I will stop there and turn it back to Kevin, but thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Kate. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, uh, we will be sending out a survey. Uh, this is the, our first virtual open house. 
and we're very open to getting feedback. So it'll, it'll take about two minutes uh, to, to take the survey. So look forward in your inbox. And thank you again so much for joining us. Take care.